So welcome to the last of this year's ranking lectures. We've had a wonderful week hearing a lot um, about the, the properties of the, the numbers 5 and 8. And today we're going to leap forward 16 and hear about the number 24. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I wish I could stay in Glasgow and start at the number 1 and just keep working on forwards uh, forever, but unfortunately I have to leave and uh, start teaching classes back in California, so this will be the, the last, for now at least. If, if I'm efficient, I'll get to some fairly fancy things at the end, but uh, we'll st start out not being so fancy. So the number 24 is really one of the most amazing numbers known. Of course, uh, we all are aware of its uh, widespread application to, to clocks. Actually, the, uh, the number 12 and 24 go hand in hand, not only in clocks, but in what I'm about to say. So you could say that half of what I'm going to be talking about is the number 12. Uh, one, yeah, I know. <laughs> Good, you got, you, you got it. Okay, just checking to see. Yeah. Um, one thing I've always been puzzled about ever since I noticed it is that there are 24 hours in a day, but uh, 12 uh, z signs of the zodiac. So for a long time, it, I didn't, didn't realize that meant that each sign of the zodiac covers two hours worth of the sky. And why? There's 13. <laughs> he says there's 13 signs. I don't think I want to get into that. I don't know. I don't think that's the answer I was looking for. So. The kind of things I want to talk about are instead these. So uh, around 1735, Leonard Euler, then a young mathematician who was just making his name, gave an amazing and strange proof that if you add up all the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, on up forever, that you get negative 1 12. Uh, this was an intermediate step towards further calculations, which led to uh, correct results. Later, the mathematician Abel wrote, the divergent series are the invention of the devil, and it is a shame to base on them any demonstration whatsoever. <laughs> At the time when Euler was doing his, his tricks, he wasn't constrained by the concept of uh, convergent series, and in a way it's very good that he wasn't because he invented lots of things that he probably never would have been able to if he had been brainwashed as we do to our students, that you should never even think about a divergent series. Uh, Euler's e equation up here has been made rigorous in a certain sense, and what's remarkable is that it's the explanation of why bosonic string theory works well in 24 plus 2, in other words, 26 dimensions. So last time I talked a little bit, very, very sketchily, about what's called superstring theory. Uh, superstring theory in, in describes lots of particles, in particular it describes both bosons and fermions. A fermion is a type of part, uh, yeah, somewhat different name for a particle that when you turn it around once doesn't come back to where it was, whereas a boson is a name for one that does come back after a single turn. Bosonic string theory w came first and is simpler and it only has bosons, none of these funny fermions. And people noticed after playing around with it for a while that it only works in 26 dimensions, and I'd like to explain to you why that's the case. Um, and it involves that equation of Euler's. Another interesting thing about the number 24 was discovered in 1875 when the mathematician Edward Lucas, who had a kind of problem series in a certain mathematical journal, he challenged his readers to prove this. Say you have a square pyramid of cannonballs, in other words, a pyramid that has the square of cannonballs at the base, and then you stack cannonballs in the uh, sort of obvious slots to make a square one smaller for the, your next row, and then so on up until you get a single cannonball at top. So you have a square pyramid of cannonballs, but suppose that when you flatten it out, you get a square of cannonballs. So it has a square number of cannonballs. And his uh, he challenged people to prove that you can only do this when the cannonball pyramid has 24 
cannonballs at the base, as in fact this one does here, if you look carefully. So, so in other words, there are 24 squared cannonballs at the bottom, and then 23 squared cannonballs at the next row, on up to 1 squared at the top, and the sum of those is a square number itself. It happens to be 70 squared. That turns out to be a very special property of the number 24. It's also true, of course, for the number 1, but that's sort of boring. Um, so, in fact, it's true that the only integer solution of this uh, equation above, if you don't count the silly ones n equals 0 and n equals 1, is n equals 24. Actually, Lucas didn't know how to prove that. I don't know how he got away with posing these puzzles that he didn't know the answers to. <laughs> but, uh, but in 1918, I believe, uh, f the first proof came out that, that this is the only solution. So this looks like a, a curiosity. I mean, this is the kind of math problem that I used to hate because, you know, it, didn't se it doesn't seem to be useful for anything and it's hard as well. Uh, but, but it turns out that this particular uh, solution leads to the densest possible way of packing spheres in 24 dimensions. And I'll explain how you get, how, it, how it's connected to that. And it turns out that when you combine that idea with the other idea I mentioned, that bosonic string theory only makes sense in 26 dimensions, some really amazing things happen. So there's actually a relationship between these two amazing features of the number 24 that make, lead to even more amazing things. But okay, now I want to go back and actually explain some of these ideas a bit more carefully. So here's Euler's crazy calculation. So Euler started with the geometric series that we uh, all learn as soon as we start playing around with infinite series, that 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and on up forever is equal to 1 over 1 minus x. So that's pretty easy to prove. You just multiply both sides of the equation by 1 minus x, and you see on the left-hand side some, some things cancel, and you're left with just a 1. So he took that equation, and by the way, I should say Euler, clearly for several years, he was spending all his time just playing around with series in all possible ways, and that's how he managed to get all the really good results, leaving nothing for us, really. Uh, so he, he differentiated, except for someone named Ramanujan, who was able to think of some others that Euler missed. Uh, so he differentiated both sides. So you differentiate 1, you get 0. Differentiate x, you get 1. Differentiate x squared, you get 2x, and so on. Over on the left, you take, run some calculus, and you, you differentiate 1 over 1 minus x, and it turns out you get 1 over 1 minus x squared. So far, no big deal. Then he set x equals negative 1. So then he got 1 minus 2, because x is minus 1, plus 3, minus 4, and so on, is equal to, if you work it out over here, 1 quarter. So at this point, we would usually slap our students' wrists and tell them, no, no, don't do that. This series on the left here does not converge, so it makes no sense to say that it equals one quarter. And we have a whole theory about that, saying that this equation up here only makes sense when x is small enough, only when it's within the so-called radius of convergence, namely, if its absolute value is smaller than 1, these partial sums converge to an answer, which turns out to equal this. The number x equals negative 1, it's actually right on the, right on the border of the circle uh, of, uh, that has the radius of convergence. And so there, all bets are off, and we normally say that this is nonsensical. But Euler, luckily, hadn't taken that class. <laughs> so he just went on. So what he was really trying to do was study this function, actually, it now is called the Riemann zeta function, but that came later, and I'm sure it wasn't called zeta at the time. But what it is, it's this function, zeta of s is 1 to the negative s plus 2 to the negative s plus 3 to the negative s plus 4 to the negative s, and so on. He wanted to evaluate this function. And in fact, he was famous for having figured out what uh, zeta of uh, 2 was, I guess. Um, and these were probably this in the same bout of calculations that he did this calculation I'm about to describe. So what did he do? He multiplied both sides by 2 to the negative s. So now we have 
2 to the negative s plus 4 to the negative s, and so on. The even uh, number is showing up here. Then I subtracted twice this one from this one. So 1 minus 2 times 2 to the negative s times a to the s is equal to this one minus twice this one. So the odd terms get left alone, but the even terms, you're subtracting twice uh, that even term from each even term here, so you get a minus sign there. So now we have this alternating series that is reminiscent of the zeta function, but with a minus sign every other time. And so that's equal to, to this. So then he took this, so I'll just write the same equation again up top here. He took this equation and then he set s equals negative 1 in this equation. So, so when s is negative 1, this is a half, no, I'm getting something, when s is negative 1, this is, uh, this is 2, so 1 minus 4 is negative 3. Zeta of negative 1, so you're taking, that's 1 to the 1 plus 2 to the 1 plus 3 to the 1, so that's this sum that we're considering, actually, that's the point of all these manipulations. Here, when s is negative 1, we get the alternating series that he had just evaluated. He knew that that right-hand side was equal to a quarter. We just figured that out. So we see that negative 3 times this stuff is equal to a quarter, so therefore this stuff has to equal negative 1 twelfth. So that was his calculation, surprisingly simple. Uh, so what does it mean? It seems bizarre that you would be adding up all the uh, integers, all the natural numbers in the world and getting something negative and something so specific as negative one twelfth makes it even more scary or amusing. Well, nowadays what we do, you see, is we say, well, you're not allowed to do those kind of things, but I'll show you some other way to make it rigorous. So here's how we, here's how we say it now. It's much more complicated, but what we say is that this series here called the zeta function, it only converges when s is big enough, more precisely when the real part of s is big enough so that these get small very quickly. So if the real part of s is bigger than 1, this converges and it converges to an analytic function. So you have this analytic function, very nice function, on half of the complex plane and then you can try to do what's called analytically continuing it to other values off of that half plane. And sometimes you may run into problems when you try to do this thing, this uh, continuation. But in this case, in fact, you really don't have many problems. There's certain poles along the negative real axis where, where your continuation diverges. But, but at negative 1, there's no problem. You there's a unique way to analytically continue it, and you get this answer. So, so this is how we say these things this time. So basically, Euler was playing around with these divergent series, but somehow he was always doing so with such exquisite taste that his results could always be justified somehow by some analytic continuation method. So whereas if you or I were to just naively start bumbling around with divergent series, we could just arrive results like 1 equals 0 or something like that, but he had enough smarts to know to avoid the problems and get to really interesting things. Uh, so it's really just when you try to teach everybody to work with series that you need to impose rules to keep them <laughs> from getting in trouble, and that's sort of what analysis is about, I guess you could say, a certain portion of analysis. Uh, so, so that's that's a sketch of how you can make that rigorous, but I don't really want to focus on why th how you can make things rigorous. I just want to have fun since it's Friday afternoon. <laughs> so so I, I just want to go right ahead and tell you about how you can use this equation to do something. So I need to teach you, or pretend to teach you, a little bit of physics. So there's a concept called a harmonic oscillator. It's, it's something that swings back and forth or vibrates back and forth, and, and it's a, many different physical systems can be approximately described as harmonic oscillators. And for example, a piano string, if you pluck a piano or violin string, its vibration can be described as an oscillator. 
And in classical mechanics, oscillators were one of the things that people studied intensively and got to understand very well, and they basically just wiggle back and forth in a sine or cosine kind of way. But when quantum mechanics was first invented, one of the first kind of problems they confronted is how does an oscillator work in quantum mechanics? So I'm not really going to tell you too much about quantum mechanics, but the main first shocking thing is that while in classical mechanics a harmonic oscillator can have any energy, in other words, I could swing it so that it has a lot of energy, or swing it so it has more, or I could let it completely rest and have no energy, but in quantum mechanics, and hence the name, the energy is quantized. It can only take certain discrete values, which depend on the details of the oscillator, of course. Uh, if the oscillator wiggles in back and forth with the frequency omega, that is, if classically it wiggled like sine of omega times t, then quantum mechanically its energy can only take this discrete set of values that's proportional to omega. So things that wiggle faster have more energy. And here I'm working in units where Planck's constant is equal to 1. It was really Planck who came up with this idea. And one of the most, so it's already shocking to think that energy of some wiggling object can't occur in any amount. It can only wiggle in sort of quantized amounts. But more shocking than that is that the lowest energy is not zero, it's, it's one half omega. So that even when the oscillator is, has its least possible energy, it doesn't have no energy. And the reason really is the uncertainty principle. So classically, you can have an oscillator such that its displacement is zero and its velocity is zero. And so then its kinetic and potential energy are both zero, and so it has no energy and it will just sit there at rest. But in quantum mechanics, if you know exactly where something is, you don't know exactly where it's, how fast it's going and vice versa. So the least energy it can have is still not zero. There's a little, you have to imagine it's sort of like twitching around slightly due to the inability for us to know for sure that it's at the bottom there and not moving at all. And that little bit of fuzziness is called, gives, contributes some energy called the ground state energy of the oscillator at one half omega. If you like getting things right, it's really one half omega times Planck's constant, where Planck's constant is a tiny little number that tells you sort of the scale at which the world becomes sort of fuzzy or, or quantum mechanical. The fact that it's small is why people hadn't known about this until fairly late. Now, let's apply that idea to a string. Here, well, let's, here is a picture of a violin string where the ends are held down. Uh, I would like to apply this idea eventually to the kind of string I've been talking about before, which is a closed string, but it's just easier. They work very similarly, and it's uh, easier to draw pictures in this, in this case, and to visualize it. So, so here's a violin string. Now a violin string can oscillate in lots of different ways, sometimes called different modes, vibrational modes. If you pluck it right in the middle, it wiggles like this up and down. If you like hold it down in the middle and pluck it one quarter of the way across, or really if you're just clever, maybe you could just pluck it up here and pluck it down there at the same time and let go, it'll vibrate like this and it will vibrate twice as fast. Its frequency will be twice as fast. It'll be ringing at one octave higher than this frequency. So before I was telling you a little bit about music and nice chords, so this is sort of the, the nicest, um, almost blandest chord possible, an octave. And then it can wiggle three times as fast, four times as fast, and so on. So I guess all these are very nice sounds. I guess this would be an octave and a fifth, uh, and, and so on. So it can have these different frequencies one, two, three, and so on, if I call the lowest frequency one. Um, so what I'm really trying to say here is that you can think of a violin string as not just a single harmonic oscillator, but a whole bunch of harmonic oscillators because, in fact, in addition to being able to vibrate in these particular ways, it could vibrate in combinations of these waves. ways. There could be there's what's called the superposition principle, saying that you could you, you could set up your, your violin string in some complicated wiggly pattern and you could think of that complicated wiggly pattern as a sum or linear combination of these different wiggly patterns. And each of those individual 
uh, wiggly patterns that it's built up of will do its own thing and not interfere with, with the rest. So that mathematically, a violin string is really just the same thing as a, as a countable collection of harmonic oscillators of frequencies 1, 2, 3, and so on. So if you understand the quantum mechanics of an oscillator, you really can understand the quantum mechanics of a string, which is actually the basis of string theory. Now, we already see something interesting here. So, as I just said, a string that can only wiggle in one direction. I'm only thinking right now about a string that can wiggle up and down, okay? It's the same thing as an infinite collection of oscillators with frequencies 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now, I told you a minute ago, and you didn't have a time to object yet, that, that if you have an oscillator with frequency omega, it's ground state energy. The lowest energy is one half of that frequency. So now we apply that idea to this string regarded as a collection of oscillators. And you have to know that energy is additive. So if I have something of energy this and something of energy that, I just add the energies to get the total energy. So the total ground state of our energy of our string should be one half of one plus two plus three and so on up to infinity. So that's a very typical example of how you get into infinities in quantum theory and in quantum field theory. If you study quantum field theory, you will see it's a very strange experience for a mathematician. You, you'll see that you do a bunch of calculations, then you get an infinite answer to some interesting question, and then you sort of go, <coughs> well, now we have to do some trick to get that get rid of that, and then we march ahead again, and then you, whoops, you hit another infinity, and then you have to do something else, um, which just means that quantum field theory hasn't been made mathematically rigorous yet. Uh, it's, it's people have worked very hard at making it mathematically rigorous, and no one has really succeeded, uh, but I think someday people, people will, because it, it actually works very well. So it, there's definitely something right about it, but we just don't know what the rules are exactly. Anyway, this is the very first infinity that you run into. You say, I've got a string, I treat it quantum mechanically, what's its ener least energy? And the answer is infinity. That's what I would have run into like when I was first studying quantum field theory. I didn't know about all this fancy stuff, so I didn't know that I, the answer was really <laughs> negative 1 24th. Um, so in other words, if you believe in Euler's crazy calculation that where these add up to negative 1 12th, then the ground state energy of the string should be minus 1 24th. Of course, that may not uh, make you feel any better than having the answer be infinity. But in fact, amazingly, this seems to really be the correct answer for the ground state energy of a string. What do I mean by correct? Well, the main thing I mean is that if you assume it's true, you get consistent results and a, a, a nice theory that works. And actually, in some kind of context, it actually m meets with experiment. We haven't really been able to test string theory as a theory of the physics of the universe, but there are simpler physics problems where you can actually, see, uh, where you can actually test these kind of calculations. And the fancy name for this thing is zeta function regularization, which is probably, you know, whenever someone says something long and intimidating like that, you can tell that like secretly, you know, they just have something completely crazy that they're trying to cover up. <laughs> uh, you've heard about all the financial terminology that you uh, hear about now, with, uh, <laughs> short selling and stuff like that. You know, they're basically doing calculations, something like that. Uh, so. Um, so, okay, so then if you have, now let's imagine you have a string that can wiggle not just in one direction, but in n different directions. For example, a piano string in three-dimensional space could wiggle up and down, but also across, so n would be two. Uh, if you have a string in 26-dimensional space-time, it, the surface of the string in space-time would be two-dimensional, so there'd be 24 perpendicular directions, so there'd be 24 directions it could, it could wiggle, and so its ground state energy would be 24 times this. Again, I'm just using the principle that energy is additive. So its ground state energy would be negative 1. So that's like the quickest explanation of what's so great about being in 26 dimensions. But of course, the next question is, what's so great about the energy being negative 1? It looks like a nice simple number, but what, what's better about that than any other number? So now I need to explain to you what, a little bit more deeply what's, so, what's the deal. So 
this is going to start seeming more and more surreal, but uh, usually it's just, as I said, cloaked with lots of incomprehensible jargon to, to assuage you. But, but really, it's very crucial in string theory to think about a string that actually loops around in time. So this is some funny picture maybe we're like the, where the time direction is maybe going this way, and we're imagining a string marching along, then it goes, whoops, I forgot my lunch, I have to go back and get it. Uh, and so it would trace out a torus if it does something like this. And it turns out that it's very crucial in string theory to have a formula for the probability, or more precisely, something called the amplitude. The, well, let me for a second say the probability that a string will do any such thing. Different, there can be tori of different sizes or shapes, and the probability that it will do this depends on the shape. Now, I'm not at all explaining to you why is it important to know the probability that the string loops around like this. That actually takes a while to explain, but it's, uh, I will just say that if, if we imagine time passing and imagine a movie of this, so as, as, my, as my marker moves across here, we're imagining what's happening uh, at each slice, what it would look like would be a string suddenly appearing out of nowhere and then splitting in two and then colliding back together and then disappearing. So you would start out with nothing, then a string would appear, split, merge, and then disappear again. That would be the kind of thing that, uh, that particle physicists would call a vacuum fluctuation or a vacuum bubble. You may have heard vague rumors of the fact that the vacuum isn't actually empty, that there's lots of little things wiggling around and going on in there. And, and, that, and that's the kind of thing that's going on in particle physics and in string theory, is little things getting created and disappearing. And it turns out that you need to actually know formulas for how those things work. So let's figure out, or I will tell you the formula for this, and then I'll show you that this formula is only going to be consistent in that special case when the string can wiggle in 24 different directions perpendicular to its surface. So I want to describe to you a shape of a torus, and a very nice way to describe tori of different shapes is to take a plane and draw a lattice in it, and when you have a lattice in the plane, you get a lot of parallelograms like this one, and if you have a parallelogram, you can curl up the opposite edges and make it into a torus. The shape of the torus will, of course, depend on the shape of this parallelogram. So that's how we'll parametrize the different possible shapes of par parallelograms or tori. Now it turns out one of the key features of string theory is that it's said to be conformally invariant, meaning that the overall size of the torus doesn't matter at all. So that we can assume that the distance from here to here is whatever number we want, and I'm just picking 2 pi because that's convenient. Uh, and then all that matters about our torus is then where this corner is. So if I had a torus that was bigger, I could just shrink it down so that this distance was 2 pi, and you have to take my word for it that that won't affect the calculation. So we're just using this one number here, in, or this one point in the plane, to describe our torus. But now we're going to use this trick that I mentioned that goes back to Argand of thinking of the plane as the complex numbers, the complex plane. So you think of T as a complex number whose imaginary part is positive because it's in the upper half plane. And the formula then for the amplitude of a string that's curled up in this kind of torus is this. It depends on that number T. What you do is you sum up over all the different ways the string can wiggle, all the different vibrational modes. Each of those different vibrational modes will have its own specific energy, say E sub K, and you calculate E to the minus I E sub K T, and you add them up. So I'm, I'm not going to explain why this is the right thing to do. Uh, although it does have a lot to do with how something of energy E sub k will be vibrating at a rate pro proportional to E sub k. So this is some kind of oscillatory function. Notice that T for us will be in the upper half plane. So a typical example of a T would be a positive imaginary number. Uh, 
in that case, then this would be an exponentially decreasing thing. But if t was moving along the real axis, this thing would be oscillating. But anyway, those are, those are just some facts that I'm not really explaining where the formula is coming from. But anyway, it's a simple formula. You, can, you have to grant it that, at least. So it's called the partition function of the string. That's just a good buzzword to know if you tell somebody, I heard from this professor the amplitude of a string to be this shape. They'll look at you funny. They'll think you don't know what you're talking about. But if you say partition function, they will think you know what you're talking about. Yeah. So they may be more forthcoming with information about it. So I want to calculate it for a string. And to calculate it with the minimum of pain and fairly quickly, I'll use a couple of facts. So first of all, Although I've introduced this idea in the, for a string, it actually works for anything. If you have any physical system that has a bunch of energy levels, different possible energies, E sub 1, E sub 2, and so on, you can write down this formula, and that's always called the partition function. It's a very general concept, in other words, that was known long before string theory and is regarded as sort of a fundamental thing you want to think about whenever you study any system. Then second of all, the second one is sort of a, a little mini theorem, which is that if you have two or more physical systems and you set them side by side, don't let them interact, just sort of set them next to each other, then you get what you might consider a, a new bigger physical system. And you could ask, how is the partition function of that new system uh, computed if you know the partition functions of the individual parts? And the answer is nice and simple. You just multiply the partition functions of the individual parts to get the partition function of the whole thing. And that's actually very easy to check from this definition if you think about it, because if you have one system that can have, say, energies 1, 2, and 3, you have another system that can have energies 4 and 5, then when you combine those systems, there'll be six different options for what the energies could be, because the first one could have energy 1, 2, or 3, the other one could have energies 4 and 5, and the energy of the whole system would just be a sum of the energy of the first one and the energy of the second one. And so if you think about that, that means that these functions here will get multiplied. If you just do a little example, like I said, you'll convince yourself that that's how it works. The exponential is what's turning some addition into multiplication. So, so using those facts, it's pretty easy to work out the partition function of a string because a string is just a big collection of harmonic oscillators. So first, we'll work out the partition function of a harmonic oscillator. So if you have some oscillator that has frequency omega, as I told you, its energies could be 1 half omega, 3 halves omega, 5 halves omega, 7 halves omega, and so on. So those are the allowed l energies. So I just plop them into the formula for the partition function here. These are the allowed energies, I guess times this omega. And I add up over all the, over all the options. So this is k equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So that's the partition function of a harmonic oscillator. And this is almost a geometric series. It, it has this e to the minus i over 2 omega t in it. We could factor that out and stick that up on top here. And then what's left is our geometric series, e to the minus i k omega t summing over k. So we just sum the geometric series. I guess this is the second time I've used the geometric series in this, in this talk. And, and you get 1 over. Uh, 1 minus e to the minus i omega t. This calculation actually is basically the calculation that Planck did that convinced him of quantum mechanics in the first place. He was studying some problem in statistical mechanics where classical mechanics was giving horribly wrong answers. And so he, he calculated the partition function uh, uh, in the quantum mechanical way. And he made this assumption that the energies took these evenly spaced values, and then miraculously he get started getting right answers. And that's what made him come up with the idea of a quantum, a quantum or a discrete unit of energy. So we'll take that formula. So that's the partition function of a single oscillator. And now we'll say, what's the partition function of a string that can wiggle in one direction? Well, that's just mathematically the same as a bunch of oscillators with frequencies 1, 2, 3, and so on. And so if you believe me, the way you get the partition function of the whole bunch is by multiplying the partition functions of the individual oscillators. So this is the formula I had on the previous transparency uh, in the case of an oscillator whose frequency is n. 
and now I'm multiplying those all where n goes 1, 2, 3, 4, on up forever. So we multiply them out. Now, the stuff on the bottom, I won't mess with. I'll just leave it there. But the stuff on top, that's actually the problematic part. If I take these things on top here and I multiply them where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, then because exponentials turn addition into multiplication, I get e to the minus i over 2 times 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, et cetera, t. So that's where Euler's crazy calculation comes in handy. Normally, if we didn't have access to those magic abilities, we would say that this is just some horrible problem, and I guess that this might converge to zero or something like that because it would be e to the minus infinity. But we won't, we won't be bullied into an answer we don't like. We'll use, we'll use zeta function regularization. That's how you make it sound official. You, we'll say, no, the, you add up those numbers and you get negative 1 12th. And this 2 here get, gives, it, gives us a 24. So this is the uh, official correct answer for the partition function of a string that can wiggle in one way. And you see that it has this 24 built right into it. So, so that's, uh, that's the magic of 24. What's really remarkable is that this function has been famous, or at least known, since 1877, which was considerably before string theory was invented. Uh, this is called the Dedekind eta function and was introduced just for purely mathematical reasons, which I'll say a little bit more about. Uh, and so when string theory came along, this, this function had been studied for a century and people knew everything about it, um, including that funny 24. Now, here's the, uh, here's the key as to why string theory only works well in a certain dimension. The point is that I've been saying I'm going to describe a torus by taking a parallelogram and curling it up. So I had drawn this parallelogram before, and I said, we'll describe the shape of this parallelogram by picking this number t, and then we'll curl it up and get a torus. But the, there's a subtlety there, which is that different choices of parallelogram can give you the same torus. So what I've drawn down here, you see, is the exact same lattice. The dots are all the same dots. And all I've done is instead of calling, instead of focusing attention onto this parallelogram with this corner at t, I've focused attention on a different parallelogram where the corner now is over here, over here. So that's t plus 2 pi, because the distance going horizontally is 2 pi each time. So I, I have a different parallelogram, but if you think about it a little bit, if you curl up this parallelogram, you'll get a torus of exactly the same shape. The, uh, the fancy way to say that is that what we're really doing is we're taking the plane modulo the lattice. We're, we're only really saying I take points on the plane and I decree two of them to be the same if they differ by a point in the lattice. And that doesn't care which parallelogram you've decided to pick as your favorite parallelogram. Uh, maybe another way to say it that's a little less fancy is that if I curl up this into a torus, I could still draw this line on that torus, it would look like this, and you'd see that I would have the same torus but only with some different lines drawn on it describing the edges of the parallelogram. So this would give me a torus with lines like this on it. This one would give me the same torus but the relevant lines would be this one, this one, which is the same as this one, and so on. So it would just be sliced a different way but the same shape. So the problem is, we wrote down a formula for the partition function of the, of the string that depended on the choice of t. It was a formula that depended on t. But different values of t, namely t and 2 plus 2 pi, are really giving us the same torus. So we'd better get the same answer if we use t or t plus 2 pi in our formula. Otherwise, it's just not consistent. So here's that formula. Here's the formula for the partition function of the string. I'm saying that this would really only give a consistent answer if it had the property that when you add 2 pi to t, you get the same answer. Unfortunately, that's not true. It changes. 
This stuff in here doesn't change at all when you add 2 pi to t because e to the i 2 pi is 1. So if I add 2 pi to t and multiply by an integer and then exponentiate it this way, that won't change. So this stuff is OK. This won't change if we add 2 pi to t. But this annoying thing does change. When you add 2 pi to t, it gets multiplied by this factor, e to the 2 pi i over 24. So the partition function of a string that can wiggle in one direction changes when you change which parallelogram you use to describe the torus. So we say that, sadly, that that string theory, where the string has only one direction to wiggle, just isn't consistent. However, if we had a string with, say, 24 directions to wiggle, remember, when you, that's the same mathematically as having 24 different strings wiggling. Each, having 24 directions to wiggle means you need to say how much it wiggles up, how much it wiggles across, and so on. But you could just think of those mathematically as one string wiggling up, one string wiggling across, and so on. So, so you may you may think of a string with 24 directions to wiggle as 24 separate strings. And I said that the partition functions multiply when you combine several systems. So the partition function of, this, of these 24 separate strings will be z to the 24th power. And that's nice, because if I take this to the 24th power, it's equal to 1. So this fudge factor disappears when we work with a string that has 24 directions to wiggle. So in that case, that is when space-time is 26-dimensional, we get a consistent string theory. And so now you know why string theorists say these weird things like bosonic string theory only works in 26 dimensions. There are actually other things that are required to work to make it all be consistent, but they all miraculously work in 24 dimensions. Um, Interestingly, this function as well, z to the 24th, was also famous long before string theory. Actually, its reciprocal was really what was famous. It was called the discriminant of an elliptic curve. So mathematicians are sometimes really inspired at inventing terminology that makes it hard to tell what they're talking about. So like, you'd think that an elliptic curve would be like in a curve that looked sort of like an ellipse. <laughs> No, no, no. It's a surface that looks like a donut. Right, see? <laughs> this is the, uh, there is a reason why, a very good reason why it's called an elliptic curve. But uh, I think the first thing to learn about elliptic curve theory is that an elliptic curve is a donut. Okay? <laughs> so uh, it's a torus formed by curling up a parallelogram, which you maybe think of as a parallelogram in the complex plane. And there are lots of different shapes of elliptic curves. The discriminant is something that you can calculate for any elliptic curve. I've told you how to calculate it. It's just one over this thing. And what made people so interested in it is that it's a very special function. It discriminates the difference between an a uh, torus that's a respectable torus and a torus where the parallelogram is completely flattened out to being sort of one-dimensional. So see, there are all sorts of shapes of parallelogram. But you can imagine taking a parallelogram and sort of flattening it out more and more. And then in some limit, it would just be completely squashed down. And you probably shouldn't even call it a parallelogram then. And the discriminant is the simplest function you can cook up that will take different values for these, but it will approach 0 when it approaches this squashed up situation. So people who are studying elliptic curves needed a, a uh, function that would detect when the when the elliptic curve collapsed. And it, remarkably, the simplest function that really does the job is this discriminant. When I first saw it, because it has this 24th power in it, I was completely confused. But uh, it's probably easier to understand it with the help of a little bit of the string theory, that, uh, that it's in some sense the, uh, the, the, the simpler function in some sense is this one. But this one has the problem that when you change t, it, it, it's, it, it changes. So to get rid of that problem, you have to raise it to the 24th power. And then you're left with this stuff to the 24th power. So that's the thing you see in the formula for a discriminant. So this is all old, but still very active in lively mathematics, the theory of elliptic curves. 
Now, you should still be wondering why the number 24 keeps showing up when we play around with elliptic curves. And I thought about it for a while, and I realized there's sort of some basic, uh, simple reason. It, but it's actually quite hard to explain why it's the reason. But I, so I won't try to do that just now, but I'll just tell you what it is, just so you see that there is something interesting going on. Namely, we're getting elliptic curves, or curled up parallelograms, from lattices in the plane. And there are lots of different shapes of lattice in the plane, but there are two that are very special, which I talked about in my last talk. The one that has four-fold symmetry and the one that has six-fold symmetry. So I call these the Z squared and the A2 lattice. And it turns out that those lattices of exceptionally high symmetry turn out to play a really prominent role in the theory of all lattices or all elliptic curves. And they sort of wind up governing the whole subject in an interesting way. And it all boils down to the fact <laughs> that 4 times 6 is 24. It's, it's really true. I mean, I'm not explaining why it's true, but that, that's sort of where it's coming from. So you can mull on that. Uh, I, I'll try to write a paper about, about these things in which I actually go on and explain that. But instead, I want to talk about these cannonballs. So, so back to the cannonball puzzle. So uh, I won't explain why this is the only solution. I don't really even understand too well why it's the only solution. But I will say one interesting thing is that the proof that this is the only solution uses elliptic curves, interestingly. So it's a very strange extra twist to the subject. Uh, people in ellip use elliptic curves to study Diophantine equations, equations where you're looking for integer solutions. And it turns out that this is perfectly suited to that. So, but I don't even know how that's related to the other appearance of elliptic curves in this talk. Math is full of these sneaky things. Um, so last time I was talking about the densest ways of packing spheres in various dimensions up to 8. Now it turns out, because of this bot periodicity phenomenon that I mentioned, packing lattices in some dimension is, has interesting similarities to packing spheres in the dimension 8 more. And the dimensions that are multiples of 8 turn out to be specially interesting. I'll just briefly say that there's an idea of an even unimodular lattice. That's a lattice where you have one center of a ball per unit volume. That's unimodular. And even means that if you take any two points in that lattice and think of as them as vectors and take their dot product, you get an even number. So it turns out that even unimodular lattices are only possible in dimensions that are a multiple of 8. So it's one of these amazing, strange things. And so in 8 dimensions, E8 is the only even unimodular lattice. And then you can say, well, what about other multiples of 8? Well, in dimension 16, it turns out that there are exactly two even unimodular lattices. In dimension 24, there are 24 even unimodular lattices. And the densest one of them is this special, which is the densest of all lattices in 24 dimensions. It's called the Leech lattice. The Leech lattice is a really amazing thing. It's large. It's hard to understand. I wouldn't at all say I have any intuition of it. It has a lot of spheres touching each sphere. This number and numbers suspiciously close to this number show up in a wide variety of subjects that all wind up getting to be related to the Leech lattice. But, but I just want to at least tell you what the Leech lattice is and how it's related to the cannonballs. So, so let's start with 26 dimensions. So you thought I was talking about 24 dimensions, but now I switched a little bit. I'm talking about 26 dimensions. And I'm going to define a dot product for vectors in 26 dimensions that's sort of like the usual dot product that, you, that, you're, that you're used to, except that it has a minus sign at the very end. Of course, if you studied special relativity, you'll know that that's the kind of way you should do the dot product of vectors in space-time, where you take the usual dot product of the space components, but then you subtract out uh, this product of the time components. So I'm secretly talking here about 26-dimensional space-time, which is something I was talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, so sitting inside this space of 26-dimensional vectors, there's a lattice, z26. That is the lattice where all these entries of the vector are integers. 
And there's a particularly interesting vector in z to the 26, which is the vector whose components go like this. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, blah, 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 up to 24. So that's a total of 25 of them so far because of that 0. And then 70. The reason why this vector is so wonderful is because its dot product with itself is 0 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 da, 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 minus 70 squared. And that's equal to 0, thanks to Lucas's uh, calculation. I mean, the easy part of Lucas's calculation. Uh, so that's a vector whose dot product with itself is 0. Now, if you're used to ordinary space, it seems weird to have a non-zero vector whose dot product with itself is 0. But if you're used to special relativity, you, you call, you're used to such things, and you call such vectors light-like because they're their, their length in the space direction is exactly equal to their length in the time direction. And light goes as far in space as it does in time. It sort of like goes at a 45 degree angle if that's space and that's time. So this is a vector that could be like the direction that a ray of light is pointing. But what's special about it is, of course, also that it has integer entries. So now what do we do with this wonderful thing? Well, what we do is we look at its perp. We look at all the vectors with integer entries whose dot product with that is 0. So we look at all the guys in z26 whose inner product with v is 0. And that will be a lattice It'll, because it's a sub thing of z to the 26. It's contained in z to the 26. But it will just be 25 dimensional because you've imposed one equation. You, so you could do that kind of thing quite generally. But what's special about the fact that this dot product of this vector with itself is 0 is that actually v is contained in v perp. In other words, v is a vector in this set here because its dot product with itself is 0. So that's a very special thing that you can do when you have a light-like vector in a lattice. So we have this 25-dimensional lattice. We have this vector in it. And then there's something you can do, and now I guess I'm actually doing advanced math. You can take a lattice and you can mod out by a vector in that, meaning we decree two vectors in the lattice to be the same if they differ by some multiple of, of that one. And if you do that, it reduces the dimension by one. So this quotient, as it's called, it will be a 24-dimensional lattice, and that's the Leech lattice. So that's a trick that relied heavily, of course, on having this having this uh, cannonball problem solution. Uh, so it only works in 24 dimensions. So it's a long step from that to seeing why this is the densest lattice in 24 dimensions. And I admit I don't really know the pr proof of that. I know certain books that contain the proof. But that's <laughs> so far, that's been good enough for me. Um, I, instead of saying more about that, I just want to lead up to where all this goes. I should mention that Leach was Leach taught here, right? So is that true? Did he ta teach here, or did he just sort of hang out here? No, he, he kept oh, I'm sorry. That's right. So I hadn't known that when I prepared this talk. So unfortunately, he's not still with us, so we can't all pester him and ask him the properties of, of his lattice. Uh, so. So now I'm going to sketch very sketchily how you combine the two ideas that I've described. So I've given a pretty decent explanation of why bosonic strings like to have 24 extra dimensions besides their own two to wiggle around in. And I've more sketchily described this Leech lattice, which works in 24 dimensions. And so you can try to combine those two ideas in some insane way. And here's how it goes. So you can take. 24-dimensional space, r to the 24, and you could mod out by this lattice, which is a glorified way of what I was doing in two dimensions, where I had this lattice, and I said, I will mod out by it, which amounts to taking the parallelogram and curling up the faces. So now you just have to imagine that picture in 26 dimensions. You have this 26-dimensional lattice. There's some kind of parallelogram thingies. You curl up their faces, and you get, I hope I said 24-dimensional lattice. I think I said 26. You have a 24-dimensional lattice in R24. You mod out by it, and you get this 24-dimensional torus. That would be a kind of space that strings might especially enjoy <laughs> wiggling around in, because it's taking advantage of all the marvelous properties of 24. 
However, it turns out to be better to do something slightly different, and I don't understand this either. It's better to actually use what's called T mod Z mod 2. In other words, you take these points in here, which came from points in R to the 24, and you count the points x and negative x is the same. For those of you who like such things, this guy is a manifold, but this thing is a little bit scarier. It's called an orbifold because you've sort of folded it in half in a funny way. And in 1986, Richard Borchard showed that if you do string theory where you let strings wiggle around in this space, you get a string theory that's incredibly symmetrical. It has an enormous group of symmetries called the monster for good reason. The monster has that many elements. It's a it has about 8 times 10 to the 53rd elements. You see, people were trying to classify what are called uh, finite simple groups, that is, collect finite symmetry groups that don't have any smaller group inside that you could mod out by to get something smaller. And those simple groups were classified, and most of them fit into nice patterns, but there are 26 exceptional ones. And by the way, nobody knows if that number 26 has anything to do with any of the other 26's that I've mentioned. If you ask an expert on this, they'll say, no, that is just a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, right. <laughs> Whereas this, of course, is something that makes sense. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> so, so, so there are 26 sporadic or exceptional finite simple Groups and the last one to be discovered and the biggest one was called the monster. It was predicted to have existed by Fisher and Greece since 1973, but an actual proof of that it existed happened in 1981. Uh, but that left begging the question: What is this enormous group the symmetries of? And now, in some sense, that has been answered at least more than before, namely it's the symmetries of the string theory in this particular space-time. That may still seem mysterious, but it's a lot of progress. The monster group was shown to have a lot of relationships to elliptic curves. Uh, for example, there's a function that you can use to describe all elliptic curves. If you want to assign a number to any elliptic curve, there's a function called the J function that does that, that people had known about, again, since the 1800s. And if you look at the Taylor series of the J function, it has some bizarre coefficients. And it turns out that those bizarre coefficients match the dimensions of representations of this monster group. So it's taking, starting with some subject that seems perfectly simple, namely studying parallelograms in the plane, you're quickly led into this bizarre business of this monster group. And in some sense, Borchard's result uh, clarifies that, but it's still regarded as very mysterious. This whole subject is called monstrous moonshine to, for various reasons. One is that it's bizarre, crazy, and another is that someone offered somebody a bottle of moonshine whiskey uh, to, uh, to, I guess, to settle the relation, to prove that there was a relationship between the J function and this group. So now, it's been proved that there is this relation, but I think there's a lot of very mysterious stuff left here because we're getting a relationship between things that seem incredibly simple, like parallelograms in the plane, and things that seem incredibly complicated, like this group here. But they're like linked very tightly, and, and the number 24 is sort of at the heart of it all. So as I've tried to show you, Different numbers have different personalities. For some of them, at least so far, we can't really say anything terribly interesting about them. But others, if you start peering at them, digging into them, you get pulled into strange journeys that weren't at all what you might expect. And so I think 24 is the one I like the best so far. Thanks. <laughs>